Different social cultural groups seek solutions to Nigeria's security challenges. Many advocate genuine dialogue on way forward. It is a season of defections as political parties recalibrate for relevance in the 2023 polls. Stakeholders want stronger electoral institutions and stiffer penalties for election fraud. Also on Political Update today, backing a viable sector with requisite laws to benefit from the spin-offs of global climate change initiatives. I am Fisayo Ogunfui. Welcome. The Minister of Labor and Employment, Dr. Chris Ngige, says only a peaceful society with sincerity of purpose can, gen uh, uh, can genuinely progress, uh, can genuine progress be made. And he was speaking, addressing leaders of Igbo uh, residents of the 19 northern states and the Federal Capital Territory. 69-year-old Eze Boniface Ibekwe is an Igbo trader from southeast Nigeria, residing in Kano, northwest Nigeria, for more than 40 years. He is a member of the Kano State Traditional Council and in the payroll of the state government for decades. We cannot live in isolation. Nigeria is a great country. And all of us, we benefit from Nigeria more better than separation. As the Boniface and other Ezendibos drum from across the country are concerned about Nigeria's unity and security in view of happenings in the country, hence the need to explore their role as custodians of the traditional institution to add their voices to the ongoing agitations and demands. Who are you separating with? The Hausa man, the Yoruba man, the Igbo man, the Gala man, the Gwari man. The same God that brought us together has a reason, a purpose for bringing us together. The Igbos of Nigeria and Nigerians were indigenous to Nigeria. We will not support the breakup of Nigeria. We will not work for the breakup of Nigeria. The Minister of Labor and Employment, Chris Ngige, said there are two types of leaders in a democratic society, but President Muhammadu Buhari represents the non-partisan, non-religious, and non-tribal politician in Nigeria. So, Infrastructure-wise, we have gotten our fair share. There is no matrix man there. We are there in the Federal Executive Council. And the Federal Executive Council is composed of ministers from per state. President Buhari gave us six, one extra. A lot of them don't understand that I, as a member of the Federal Executive Council, can influence things that will come to my state, influence things that will come to my zone, influence things that can even come to any other area of Nigeria. But much more importantly, the propaganda against this government by the elites in the Southeast should stop. The meeting hoped to calm nerves and send a strong message of peace and harmonious relationship so that the likes of Eze Boniface and Eze Ogbonna will continue to pursue and sustain their means of livelihoods in peace in Kano and Meduguri. The People's Democratic Party, PDP's Governor's Forum, has reiterated the need to decentralize operations of the security apparatus of states within the existing legal framework to ensure the impute of local operators in the state and local government areas in policing and ensuring the security of lives and property. This is contained in a 14-point communique issued at the end of a meeting held in Uyo Akwaibom State. The meeting held in Uyo, the Akwaibom state's capital, reviewed most importantly the security and economic situation of the country. In a 14-point communique issued at the end of the meeting, Sokoto State Governor and Chairman PDP Governors Forum, Alhaji Aminu Tambowal, who spoke on behalf of other governors, commented on issues affecting the finances of the nation. CBN to take immediate steps to halt the depreciation the Naira. PDP governors frowned at the rising and seemingly uncontrollable debt profile of Nigeria, with over 80% of normal appropriation at the national level spent on debt services. Nigerian youth do not have adequate access to employment, and a lot of Nigerians rely on tutor for their livelihood, businesses, and self-employment. The meeting had all PDP state governors in attendance. 
Now, over the weekend in Kano, there was a grand reception by the All Progressives Congress in honor of hundreds of defectors from different political parties. Among those received are uh, prominent politicians, including a federal lawmaker, uh, governorship, uh, governorship candidates uh, during the 2019 general elections. It is a mass gathering of APC members and stakeholders from the 44 local government areas of Kano State. They variously came to either witness the reception or be received into the party. Prominent among them are Abdul Salam Abdul Karim Zaura, the governorship flag bearer of the GPN, that of PRP Salu Sagirtake, and Abba Rizkwa Muhammad, the 2015 deputy gubernatorial candidate of the PDP, Aledat Yaku member representing Bebe Jikiru Federal Constituency in the House of Representatives and many others from the Concosia camp of the party. They cited various development programs, projects and initiatives of the APC government in Kano and the federal levels as reasons for moving to the party. The new APC members were formally received by the party's caretaker committee chairman, Maima Labuni, who was represented. I am also on behalf of the national chairman, thank your excellency the governor of Kano State, for doing the work of the national chairman. Mr. President loves the people of Nigeria and he loves the people of Kano State. Governor Abdullah Umar Ganduji thanked President Muhammad Wari for his administration's numerous development projects in Kano and across Nigeria. Meanwhile, more big wigs of politics in Cross River State are changing their political identities to the APC. Some prominent uh, politicians in Boki local government area say they stand with Governor Ben Ayade and are willing to help the APC in fulfilling its concept of good governance. Today, very honorably, I am bound out and I've decided to take a step further to be with the progressive, to join them so that together we'll change the story about not just Nigeria, but Cross River State in particular. We all know that we are led by a digital governor. Since my governor has been able to look at the future and decided Cross River State will be better if we join the progressive, to further the cause of humanity, to further the common wealth of cross civilians, to ensure infrastructural development. So the Jake's coming into this party like most of his colleagues, a sitting commissioner, a law lecturer, two-time chairman, two-time member of the State House of Assembly, a former chairman of this local government, it comes with him a lot, lot of advantages and value to be added not just to Boki local government, but to Cross River State. Let's uh, take a pause and take the uh, discussion before we go to more political stories now. Nigeria is ramping up momentum to position ourselves properly to benefit from the initiatives emanating from activities surrounding climate change. The nation has launched a new national policy on climate change, on climate change, I beg your pardon, approved by the Federal Executive Council. From the legislative uh, perspective, a bill is also in the works. Honorable Sam Unuibur presented the initial bill and is now being reworked to cater for current realities. He joined us for a political update and highlighted how a whole new sector which with huge job creation potentials is emerging. We have made progress by making sure that all hands are on deck by ensuring that we get input of uh, uh, the core ministries, you know, like the Ministry of Environment and then the Ministry of uh, Justice to be sure that the bill is in line, you know, uh, with the laws and that everyone is, is captured. So that's uh, what we are doing right now. And in that sense, this is a critical bill because the world is moving on. Well, our economy is almost totally, okay, to a very large extent, dependent on oil. And if you look around the world today, you would find that, look, companies are moving away from fossil fuel or basing their energy activities on fossil fuel. 
a lot of them are moving into renewable energy. And of course, recently you saw what happened in, uh, in the Netherlands where a Dutch court issued a judgment calling on Shell to end oil prospecting within a certain period. And in fact, they are holding them partially responsible for climate change damages. Shell is of the Dutch and the court is of the Dutch. It's not like it's a Nigerian court. That's what. Then the International Energy Agency also, in a recent statement, said that oil companies should not be allowed to continue with prospecting for oil and gas if we are able going to check global warming by the year 2030. In fact, that it is almost here. And you can see, even our own brother, who is the Secretary General of OPEC, talked about the decline in investment in oil. Uh, he, even though he was talking specifically about uh, you know, deep sea oil, oil sh offshore. But it's obvious that given Nigeria's holding, our, what we have, which is about 26% of the entire oil reserves in Africa. But to see that these oil companies are no longer investing as much as they were doing before, these are clear signals. And again, if we add that to the fact that, look, we are being sandwiched by terrible challenges. Now you can see what is coming from the oil angle. A dot cut saying, Shell, stop. And then international energy agency saying, look, this agency was particularly, purposely created in 1974 to ensure that there is free flow of oil. But it's the same agency that has turned around and said, stop. It's a clear sign of trade. So from the economic angle, we are sandwiched. Then from the environmental angle, the problem from the Sahel region, the desert resting down, the farmers' headers clashes, these are problems that are joining. So we have a duty as a nation, responsible citizens, to enact a law to ensure that we are able to provide for the future, a law that is futuristic in nature, that will provide for the future an economy that is sustainable, an economy that is based on low carbon emission, so that we provide for those who are coming you know, after us. You don't see these threats coming to you from different angles. Serious economic threat is coming from this judgment, from International Energy Agency. It's not something that you said Nigerian president or anybody or the members of the National Assembly came up with. This is global. And then, this is the problem we're having from the environmental you know, angle. So when you add all this to the challenges we're even having as far as health is concerned, because some of the oil companies operating here, they don't even know rules. They just pollute the environment. I heard when you talked about Tuguni cleanup, I was fortunate or privileged to be there with the vice president when he flagged off on behalf of Mr. President, the cleanup of Ogoni in 2016 in June. So well, I'm happy that the minister has said that this, the thing is on course, but we expect that to move a little you know, faster and perhaps in a more coordinated manner than what we are seeing now. Because you don't first go to pollute and create problems and then come around and say you want to clean up. I don't even know whether all the promises they made. I'm talking of international oil companies now. Uh, because it's, uh, every activity there is based on uh, UNEX reports, you know, United Nations uh, environmental arm. Okay, so uh, whether they are keeping those promises. All right, let's say, uh, you, you know, it's a huge uh, aspect. But uh, looking at the economic aspects, mm. are there some low hanging fruits? Are there some spin offs that or economy that could be generated? for some some of this uh, when we have a well reg regulated and the bill supported sector too many of them L let me just let me give you a background this we are here we're well over 200 million persons now i also want to refer you to what happened during the deregulation and you know when nitel you remember when nitel was all powerful nitel and things like that and when we're moving into uh, telecommunication, telephone, deregulating telephone and all that. It seemed like it was not going to work. But today you find that Nigeria is a, perhaps the first destination for all these companies because of what MTN and a few of these other companies have been able to get out of this country. So what am I saying? We have things to make us benefit massively from renewable energy. We have, we have wind. We have good sun, light. We also have water. So we can easily move into renewable energy with, in fact, effortlessly. 
and then have people have jobs. If you listen very well, I was also privileged to be with Mr. President in Marrakesh, where he had Morocco. You know, Morocco, Marrakesh, Morocco, where we had a COP meeting. And um, we had, um, you know, some side meeting with uh, John Kerry when he was Secretary of State, who is now the U.S. envoy, presidential envoy on climate change. That shows you how important this thing is around the world. So what are we saying? If we are able to get a law in place to encourage investors to come, we will increase the energy that we have available for all industrial activities. We will create a situation, enabling environment for investors to come and say, this is the law we are looking at, and this is what the law says. I was in Abu Dhabi in 2017 for uh, a summit, for a conference. They have gone far. Yeah. <laughs> so, and what happened? Well, I met with very young Nigerians who are there. Some of them met first class here. And uh, we were talking with a Norwegian who had come here to do a feasibility study in some areas. But when he was trying to bring his friends together for them to come here and start investment, they discovered there was no, no law of climate change. So this law is intended to motivate, to create an enabling environment, to bring in investors, to increase energy that is available. And then allows so many of our youths, you see what they're doing with telephones and all that, allow them to be able to create employment for themselves, employ others, and help the economy to move in the right direction. Now, talking politics, I heard of the June 19 House of Representatives by election in Guaram constituency in Jigawa State. Uh, one of the aspirants, Adu Yakubu Zandam, has called on the party to address what it described as injustice done to him at the primary election. The runner-up at the primary contest, Adoya Kubu Zandam, who was accompanied to the APC state and Guaram local government area offices of the APC by hundreds of his supporters, say they are not happy with the outcome of the primary election earlier conducted. Describing APC as a peace lobbying party and Governor Mohammed Badaru Abubakar as a leader with the listening ear, the aspirant expressed confidence that they will be given fair hearing on the matter. We are proud of our people. I know they know their right. They will defend their right. And what to say about the Department of APC. APC. Reacting to the issue in a telephone conversation with NTA News, Jiga State Acting Chairman of APC stated that though the leadership is yet to receive formal complaint from the aspirant, the party has set up a reconciliation committee to unite members and ensure victory at the polls. Did they write to me? I'm not aware. Did they write to me? Okay, Did we bring any complaint letter to the State Secretariat? Have they forwarded any complaint letter? Ask them to okay. the State Secretariat of the party? Okay. Of the APC? The Guaram constituency seat at the House of Representatives was declared vacant by INEC following the death of the former member representing the area. Some stakeholders in the All Progressives Congress have reaffirmed their commitment to embrace the party as an institution and a platform to entrench democracy in Nigeria. This was during the presentation of a book titled APC's Litmus Test, Nigerian Democracy and the Politics of Change. Within the 22 years of Nigeria's democratic journey, the All Progressives Congress is eight years old. But some of its actors are as old as the country's independence. As a political party with a blend of the old and young, and having been in government at the center for six years, from May 29, 2015 to date, the 250-paged book chronicled the history of APC. Chieftains of the party have provided tips on what should be the focus of the APC's litmus test. Leaders since the guy elected under the uh, banner of the party will continue to remain accountable to the lowest level of the party. We are in charge to you, the progressive government, the progressive regime, and I think it is proper that we show to the nation that when the people want some degree of change, 
We should be responsive to it. We run a bipartisan Senate. We live in harmony with the opposition. We ensure that whatever the executive is bringing or doing is in tune with the law. The litmus test for me, whatever our party has gone through in the last six years, or eight years, as it were, we are still facing a lot of challenges. It is a book that can serve to generate the necessary intellectual discourse and pathway for the APC to fully define itself in terms of its policies, internal governance, and most importantly, its identity. The author said promoting intra-party peace stimulated his intellect. For me, one of the big challenges is that politics must not be reduced to the person of election. And the line issue about democracy is political party. What kind of parties do we have? And that is where APC is different. It was agreed that APC is only a political party providing the leadership, but the collective contributions of all citizens is what is required to promote peace, unity and development. Dari Abdullahi Gwanara's uh, package concludes political update today. We'll be back, God willing, on Friday, same time, uh, same station, giving you the very best of political news reviews, previews, and interviews. My name is Fisayo Gunfui, urging you to play your politics for the greater good. Bye bye now.